want the answer. Oh no, you're not going to tell me. Hi, I'm Dr. Sadi Dupuy. I have a PhD in learning disabilities. I'm also a diagnostician. I've been uh, evaluating kids for over 20 years. I also do a little bit of intervention and advocacy, and I'm also an adult with dyslexia and dysgraphia. Hi, my name is Kim Sharman, and I've been working with kids for the last 15 years who have dyslexia, dysgraphia, and ADHD. And uh, I'd like to also give adults and parents of these children um, information to help them advocate for them too. Well, you better explain what you said at the get-go with Cindy, tell me the answer before we start. I hate when she, she did <laughs> three questions I'm supposed to know. <laughs> I don't expect you to know them. That's okay. why I ask you the questions because I want to hear what you as a lay person thinks yeah. and you know more than most lay people do, right? And, and people need to understand that I went through this with my own daughter at age three and four, you know, so um, I do think in terms of a, a parent also, I, I play many, I wear many hats. Yes. And you wear them well and elegantly. So let's talk about the similarity subtest on the WISC. Okay. okay. Do you remember what we talked about previously with what similarities was? And you can say, no, it's okay. Well, I know you have to do visual memory. You have to, you have to be able to compare um, and contrast. Similarities, it's a verbal test. Okay, there you go. That's so why I wanted to answer. No, you don't remember what it is. Okay, so on yeah. the similarity subtest, I give you two words and I ask you how they're alike. Oh, For example, okay. I might say, in what way are a ruler and a paperclip alike? Mm. And you would say, hell, I don't know. <laughs> a ruler and a paperclip. Um, Devices for measuring versus devices for holding things together. Oh, thanks. Something obvious. They're both office, office products, right? Oh, That's geez. not an item from the IQ test. Let me just make that perfectly clear because I don't want to spoil the IQ test. And I'm so sorry I have such an itchy eye today. Um, so they take items that typically form some sort of classification early on. So the two words are related in some way. And then they go from really concrete, um, obvious, common to more and more abstract. So for mm -hmm. example, if I said, in what way are tape and glue alike? Okay, so then that would be, they are both products used to uh, affix things together. Adhesive, something like that, right? So mm -hmm. they start off with that like really kind of concrete piece and then they get more and more and more abstract. And so what I mean by abstract is you move into what's called um, a construct, meaning it's not something that you can put your hands on. Like if I say discovery, show me discovery. You can't actually show me something that is discovery. You could act out discovery, but there's not something that you can put in your hands. It's like, that's discovery. Unlike if I said, show me a tiger, you can show me a tiger in a zoo, right? But you right. it is really concrete, real items to things that become more and more and more abstract and become much more. So is this looking for your brain's ability to understand abstract thinking and inferencing and coming up with categories and cause and effect or? Yes. And so the place that infuriates most students is when we start saying things that they perceive as having no relationship when in fact they do. So, for example, if I said, um, oh, I'm trying not to use an item on the test. If I said, um, oh, my goodness, I should not have done this cold. If I said pretty and ugly. Adjectives. That between, yeah, go ahead. Oh, the adjectives that are descriptive of characteristics of any object yeah person place or, yeah well, it's a way to describe something right so right. that's and they get more abstract as you go along and the concepts become more complex as you go along so okay. for example if we talk about um again i'm trying not to use any specific terms from the test because i don't want to spoil the test uh if we talk about um the stock market that's kind of an abstract thing, right? There is no physical right. stock market, 
or there mm-hmm. used to be, but there isn't anymore, right? Is just buying and trading in space. Or if I said the internet, that becomes something that's even nebulous and requires some level of understanding of the mm-hmm. world, and how the world works to begin to draw correlations around them. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Yes. So, and why is the skill set part of intelligence? That's a really great question. And you beat me to the punch. So um, that ability plays a huge role in life. So typically when we get to more advanced learning, you do better if you can create an analogy or see a relationship. So there's a very famous story of a gentleman. uh, there There was a legal case about an elevator and there was something about the safety of the elevator and the argument by one side was that the elevator wasn't safe. And the argument by the other side was that the elevator was safe. And um, the people that were arguing it wasn't safe pulled out all these statistics and said, you know, here the data says this is horrible. It's not safe. It doesn't meet standards. And the people that were arguing that the elevator was perfectly safe called the elevator person, person that did the repairs of the elevator up to the witness stand and said, so... How do you test whether or not this is safe? And they say, well, you climb in the elevator and you get on the top and you ride the car up and down. And he said, so would you do that if the elevator wasn't safe? He said, no. He said, did you ride it? And the guy said, yes. And all the people were like, oh, duh, all of these numbers, right? The person that's really doing it understands whether or not it's safe and you wouldn't ride an elevator if it wasn't safe. So the point of that is the lawyer could establish a relationship and explain this really abstract, complex set of data and concepts in a really concrete and obvious way. And so that's how it's related to intelligence. It's like seeing correlation and understanding correlation. If this is th- and if this and this occur together, it doesn't always mean causation, but often we can make abstractions based on that, right? It can be used as a vehicle for explaining other things. Okay, and isn't it true that, too, that when, yeah, if kids have trouble with language, sometimes they're very literal in their interpretation of things, which means very. they're going to have difficulty yes. with higher learning. So let's go back to um, a pencil and a ruler. So if a kid said both of them have five letters in it, that would tell me that the kid doesn't understand the concept or I, they're so heady they're thinking beyond it so you can have kids like overthink the really simple items and i've seen kids do that um mm-hmm. it's pretty funny it's like no 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 it's not supposed to be that hard give me the obvious answer but you really can't say that <laughs> it's it's really well, yeah and that's what i was trying to do is make it more complex and it wasn't it was yeah. office yeah yeah very very simple so you you touched on something that's super important in that particular test. What did you touch on just a second ago with language? Oh, literal interpretation of language, okay. not lack of flexibility in thinking of, about language and interpreting it. Well, but we can also have kids that have a hard time word finding, right? And they can't come up with a True. specific term. And mm-hmm. if the clinician The person administering the test doesn't give adequate wait time or doesn't, you know, really give times for kids to think and think thoughtfully to respond and doesn't query appropriately. Your score may not be an accurate reflection of what that kid's true abilities are. Well, if a kid has a slow processing time and has to really think about it, is there a requirement in that test that makes them wait for the person? So there's no time limit on the test. So if you're thinking for 20 minutes or one minute, if you come up with the right answer, that's still fine. Most clinicians, so I, I, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I would not wait 20 minutes. I would never wait 20 minutes because at that point, I have a kid that's just stewing and working really hard and getting nowhere. It's like, you know, pushing against a wall to move a house. Like it's not going to be productive. That's right. right. Um, But you've got to give adequate wait time and you've got a query and um, it can be difficult to have patience with somebody as they are mentally doing them gymnastics to come to their answer. And that's kind of the trick of it um, is to recognize 
kind of the pattern of how they can provide an answer over time so that you recognize when a kid needs more time and you also recognize when a kid is not being productive and when to kind of move them forward. And another thing too is what if the kid um just doesn't understand the prompts this the pro the or, or doesn't understand the skill set of making associational connections. Do you ever have that happen? Absolutely. And that's why there is no perfect IQ test at all. So um that's where I pick an IQ test and often I will administer a second IQ test. So if I have a kid with massive receptive and expressive oral language deficits, I pick an IQ test that doesn't require that. So for example, the KABC, love the test. Um, the one of the knowledge subtests is you look at six pictures and I say something and you have to tell me which of the six pictures goes to that. So it doesn't require that verbal description or response or explanation of your idea. Um, and when you give the riddle subtest, there's one, it's a one word answer. And so, and again, it's on time. So it can take as long as they need to, to come up with it. Um, and so sometimes different IQ tests give you very different numbers just by the way they're formatted and how they look at things. And so that's the craft of assessment. And that and maybe repeat at school, you're not given this choice of 10 or 20 or, or 100. I don't know how many IQ tests there are. 100 IQ tests. But most, yeah, you're right. Most school psychologists have one at their school and the district may have a spare, like most school districts will have the WISC. And we'll have a copy of the Stanford Binet or a copy of the Wilcock Johnson Cognitive as their backup in case the WISC has already been used. But they typically don't let you kind of build a testing library the way that I have to really find what you think may be the ideal assessment for that child. And and I go, I know maybe I'm over clarifying this, but parents need to understand that Cindy puts a lot of time in to trying to find an IQ test that doesn't hammer and reduce the score of the IQ test because it doesn't hammer on the deficits. When she smells certain deficits, she's trying to eliminate that impact on their IQ test. And it makes a huge difference. I try and find a test that's gonna accurately characterize the student's learning. And the most important thing I do is when I see a lot of variability in test scores and it doesn't make sense, I say we should not be using the full scale IQ off of that. We should throw it off, throw it out. And there is a stipulation in the law that says if the IQ score does not is not believed to be an accurate representation of the individual's ability, you can go to a pattern of strengths and weaknesses. And that strength- oh, So you're saying sometimes you can't even find the right test. Yep. How how often does that happen? Uh, I would say three to 5% of the time. Like, I don't feel like the IQ test accurately describes, like the first IQ test I give a kid won't accurately describe what they're capable of. Um, mm -hmm. And most clinicians don't value nonverbal IQs. IQ tests that take language completely out of the mix um, mm -hmm. because it's so drilled into our head that language is part of intelligence. And so it's essentially saying all the people out there that don't speak English, you can't be that intelligence because you can't provide an oral response on an IQ test. You know, that doesn't make sense. Nonverbal IQ tests have really good power and can often characterize for a student strengths that otherwise get lost. Does that kind of make they sense? They wouldn't appear. Yeah. Well, it does. And um, because well, I've experienced this with my own kid and, and remember that an IQ test is just a regular IQ test that the school gives may not be the accurate IQ of your student. That's what you need to understand. Well, and I'm not sure if I've said this in videos, but I see a shift of seven to 30 IQ points in a student having their attention dialed in versus not. So that's the difference between 
I'm not going to college to I can be going to graduate school. That's a Wait, can we clarify what you just said? Not everybody knows what you said. All right, let me drop seven to down. 30 points. What? I see a difference of seven to 30 IQ points on and off stimulant medication. So if your kid's IQ comes up here at a 90 with 100 being average, and we actually put them on stimulant medication because they have attention deficit, and we know they have attention deficit, I can see a shift of being up in that average range all the way being up here at 120 on and off stimulant medication. Oh my God. That That is... Huge. It's and that is when you get services versus you don't get services. And and this is a very, I feel like a lot of parents don't understand this. Well, I think we're going to do a whole session on how attention plays a role in IQ tests in another video. Really important. People, people really don't understand um, how debilitating this attention deficit is. It's a big one on qualifying for getting help from the school and two on being in school and being yep. able to absorb it. All right, well, that's it for today. Leave us questions, comments. If you'd like us to answer a particular question, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you.